Many years ago, I was going through something which is unusual for me. I was uh, experiencing quite a bit of fear and anxiety. And it had to do with uh, some corruption that I had exposed, which is a good thing. But what happened was some people that I cared about, it, it made life difficult for them. And I remember very vividly going to the Blessed Sacrament Chapel to pray. And I'm sitting there and just experiencing all of this fear and anxiety. And these words from Psalm 27 came to me very clearly. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I went through and read this Psalm a few times and talked to God about it and just listened and almost all my fear went away. People often ask me, how can I have a better relationship with Christ? And I often say to them, read the Bible. And they say, which parts? I say, well, if you haven't read much of the Bible, it's good to start with one of the Gospels, these short biographies of Jesus. But in addition to that, I often recommend to people that they read and pray the Psalms. The Psalms reveal some of the inner life of Jesus in a way the Gospels do not. When we pray them, we are very closely united to Jesus. To pray the Psalms better, I think it helps to learn more about them. And that is the purpose of this video series. So let's begin with some basics. What is a Psalm? A Psalm is a poem sung to music music from a stringed instrument that's plucked. And the word psalm comes from a Greek word meaning to pluck. The psalms were originally written in Hebrew. In your Bible, you'll find them in the Old Testament in a section called the Wisdom Books, after the book of Job and before the book of Proverbs. There are 150 of these poems. They vary in length, and in subject matter. Interestingly, uh, the 150 Hail Marys that are part of the traditional three sets of the Rosary Mysteries was meant to correspond to the number of Psalms. Uh, in the Middle Ages, when monks would pray the Psalms daily, many people didn't know how to read, and so they began to pray the Rosary as a substitute. Who wrote the Psalms? Well, tradition tells us that King David wrote about half of them. Likely, he would compose them in his mind and speak them aloud first and then dictate them to a scribe. There was an ancient Israelite choir known as the Sons of Korah who wrote about a dozen of the Psalms. And you'll see some of their names ascribed to individual Psalms. Two Psalms, Numbers 72 and 127, are described as being of Solomon the first being about him rather than by him. So most of the Psalms were written around 1000 BC during the Davidic Kingdom. Some Psalms were clearly written much later in Israel's history, uh, during the time of their exile in Babylon and later in their return to their homeland. And so there developed a collection of sung poetry written over several centuries edited and compiled into a final version that we know today as the Book of Psalms. There are many contemporary scholars who doubt that King David wrote any of the Psalms. They will cite such reasons as a smattering of Aramaic or references to the Jerusalem temple as pointing to composition after David, later in Israel's history. But John Bergsma and Brant Petrie address these arguments and other arguments regarding authorship in their excellent commentary on the Old Testament. They point out, for example, how historical linguistics has revealed the presence of Aramaic influence in Hebrew at almost all stages of its development. How the sacred tent that was used for worship before the construction of the Jerusalem temple is sometimes referred to as the house or the temple of the Lord. In any event, the Psalms cannot be understood apart from King David. His character and life story 
in the Davidic kingdom, its beliefs, worship rituals, and rise and fall. I love David. He certainly lived a full life. We're introduced to him in the book of Samuel as a shepherd boy. He's the youngest of Jesse's sons. And God chooses David to be the king of Israel after King Saul's disobedience. The prophet Samuel goes to David and anoints him with perfumed oil and the spirit of the Lord descends upon him. But the journey from shepherd boy to king would be neither quick nor easy. David is recruited to the service of King Saul, initially not as a warrior, but as a musician. Saul was afflicted by an evil spirit, and so he asked for a skillful harpist who could comfort him with beautiful music. David happened to be such, just such a skilled harpist, and when David played, the evil spirit went away. Saul took a liking to David and appointed him as his armor bearer. The Israelites were fighting the Philistines in what seemed to be a never-ending war. One Philistine, a giant of a man and a fierce warrior named Goliath, challenged the Israelites to send a man against him in combat to decide which side would be victorious. David volunteers and he rushes out to meet the giant. All he's carrying is a staff, a sling, and five smooth stones. Goliath sees this and he taunts David. And the young shepherd responds with unshakable faith and boldness. He said, you come against me with sword and spear and scimitar, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have insulted. David defeats Goliath and he goes on to have a, an illustrious military career as one of the best, or the best rather, of Saul's generals. But Saul becomes jealous of David's fame and tries to kill him. Even though David was best friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. David has to flee for his life for a long time. When he has a chance to kill Saul, he doesn't take it. Later, Saul dies in battle by another's hand. Now, David was a member of the tribe of Judah and they choose him as their king. You may remember that Twelve tribes of Israel come from the twelve sons of Jacob. And Jacob, before he died, sat his sons before him and spoke about each of them and, and gave some prophecies. And when he spoke to Judah, he said that from Judah would become a line of kings. Nevertheless, the other tribes didn't immediately recognize David as king until, there was af until after a brief civil war. And then David was king over all of Israel. One of the first things he does is he captures the city of Jerusalem, also known as Zion. It becomes Israel's capital. and It was the political, cultural, and spiritual center of the kingdom. The Ark of the Covenant, this gold-covered box which contained the manna, the tablets of the Ten Commandments, and Aaron's staff, was brought to Jerusalem. And David began planning the building of a great temple to glorify God. But it would be his son Solomon who would actually build it. The temple was the place where animal sacrifices, incense, and special prayers were offered to God. When David announced his intention to build the temple, God said that, I will make a great house for you, David. It's known as the Davidic Covenant. And God promised that one of the descendants of David would be a king forever. That descendant of the promise is Jesus of Nazareth. He was called the son of David. Jesus' person and mission are prefigured in many ways by David's life and the relationship David had with God. Now David was not sinless like Jesus. Among other things, uh, David commit, committed adultery with Bathsheba, who was the wife of Uriah. And when she became pregnant, he had Uriah killed. But when David sinned, he also repented. And you can read in Psalm 51 his, how his expression of sorrow for what he had done. Despite David's sins, God describes David as a man after my own heart. Could there be a greater compliment than that? When David was an old man, 
his son Absalom rebelled against him and seized the throne and threatened David's life. Those loyal to David fought back and defeated and killed Absalom. When David heard the news, he bitterly mourned the death of his son. He cried, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Absalom, my son, my son. We were rebellious sons and daughters of God, and God chose to die for our sins in place of us. Indeed, David was a man after God's own heart. In our next video, which I very much hope you'll watch, our music director, Scott Camden, will discuss the structure of the Book of Psalms, how they are purposefully organized in a way which vividly and poetically recalls the history of the Israelite nation and the way God intervened on their behalf. It's my hope that you make the Psalms a part of your family's daily prayer. They offer a uniquely intimate means of praying to God through the scriptures.